Bayfront Park is a short walk away from our downtown Miami apartment. We often walk through here at night when it's cooler. We've come to take it for granted, but the park is quite a treasure. Most city's urban cores have some parks scattered here and there, but Bayfront strikes me as both unique and puzzling. We took a winding walk through Bayfront Park and briefly through Bayside Marketplace on a Sunday afternoon. Let me tell you more about what's here. See the links in the description below for more of the history. Bayfront Park officially opened in 1925. It appears that little of that original park remains after many changes along the way. We're beginning our tour at the southwest corner of the park where lies this monument to the astronauts who lost their lives in the 1986 Challenger space shuttle disaster. I think I get what sculptor Isamu Noguchi was after here. I think the sculpture is meant to evoke the image of the exhaust trail of the ascending shuttle. I'll say that I had recorded a similar walkthrough just the day before. For over an hour we wandered and saw these same sights, but in truth, I was still very ignorant of most of what I'm going to show you here. Then I went back and I pondered what I was going to say, if anything. I realized I needed to familiarize myself with some of the history of the park if I was going to sound vaguely coherent. I was honestly surprised by what I was finding as I started pulling on that thread. I knew I had missed some things and overfilmed some other things. I needed to go back and film again. To be sure, I'm not going to claim to be an expert after only a few hours of online research. I'm also not going to try to bring all of what I learned into this video. If you want to know more than what I have to tell you, then I'll point you again to the links in the description for more. I'm happy to say that I found explanations of just about all the things we've seen in our daily walks, but this next bit here is still a mystery to me. I can't find any good explanation for this wall and staircase structure. It could simply be meant to impress people as they enter the amphitheater beyond, or perhaps it is meant to serve theatrical purposes that allow for a play. For example, to put actors behind the audience. The simple truth is that I don't know yet. My wife and I moved to Miami in February of this year, 2021. The COVID-19 pandemic was in its waning days. But, like most cities, Miami still has significant restrictions on even outdoor activities. So while it's a little disappointing, it's no surprise that Bayfront Park has been devoid of much action. The Tina Hills Pavilion looks like a great outdoor venue for all sorts of presentations. There are 200 fixed seats and total seating, lawn included, for about a thousand people. But for now, it's still barricaded off. We're hopeful that as we move through the summer, we'll start seeing concerts, plays, and so forth here. Two years after the park's 1925 opening, the city commission ordered a band shell structure to be moved from one park in town into Bayfront Park. Within a month of this move, it burned to the ground. A new one was built and opened in 1928. By 1947, that one was in such poor shape that it was condemned. A third one was built by 1950, in time for the city's birthday. The amphitheater served as a popular destination for orchestral music and many other popular events in the area. The Tina Hills Pavilion here is smaller by far than the one it replaced, and is actually the smaller of two amphitheaters in this park. Of particular historical note is that President-elect Franklin Roosevelt came to give a speech at the amphitheater in 1933. As he was concluding his remarks, a member of the audience shot several times at him. The mayor of Chicago was hit three times and died a few weeks later. A couple other people were hit and survived. It seems Roosevelt was spared thanks to a woman near the gunman hitting his arm with her purse and spoiling his aim. The Lee and Tina Hills Playground was opened in 2007 with a great array of modern playground structures and safe rubber ground cover. I think I see children on the playground after sundown when it's cooler, more often than in the heat of the sun. At least some of it is sunshaded. Just outside the playground is the sculpture of Julia Tuttle, an American businesswoman who owned the property upon which Miami was founded. The 
There is also a play sculpture of a dolphin, turtle, and manatee surfing a large wave. I don't think I've ever seen any of these species surfing. But just about every time you walk by the sculpture, I see some children or adults posing for photos under or on top of it, or just chilling. I actually grew up in Central Florida, so I'm used to Florida's heat. But I've been living in New Jersey and then Wisconsin ever since I graduated from high school. I love how sunny Miami is, but it's only the end of May and already I'm feeling the heat. It was maybe around 84 degrees out with a light breeze off the water, but I was sweating buckets within minutes. I'm learning I need to carry something to wipe my face with now and then just to keep the sweat out of my eyes. I'm so glad we live near enough to the water to get a nearly continuous breeze. And I love spending most of my time in my true natural habitat, the air-conditioned indoors. The Mildred and Claude Pepper Fountain has been bone dry since we arrived. In fact, it's been bone dry for most of the time since it was built back in 1990. Apparently, it was estimated that it would cost the city over half a million dollars a year to keep the water pumps running at full power. That would be a bit over a million bucks today. The city reduced the pump's power and gradually phased it out of use. I was so hoping it was just off for the winter and that we could see it cranked up by now. Oh well. Around 2007, the fountain was used for tethered helium balloon rides and is occasionally covered over for the main stage of the extravagant annual Ultra music festivals. The last Ultra was held here in 2018. In 2019, they moved it to a nearby island, but they decided to bring it back to Bayfront in 2020, only to have to cancel it on account of the pandemic that year and this year. I'm looking forward to having Ultra just up the street from our apartment when it returns in 2022, and especially knowing that I won't have to use the porta potties set up to accommodate over 100,000 people. The Pepper Fountain is one of many of the features designed by Isamu Noguchi as part of the 1980s renovation project. We already saw his memorial to the Challenger earlier. It's nice that they put in a little white sand beach of sorts next to the fountain, but it's behind a seawall on volcanic boulders, so calling it a beach is a bit of a stretch. I do sometimes see children playing and people walking along it, and the palm trees are a pleasant addition. I can see this weird box-on pyramid thing from my window. It's much bigger than it looks here. I have no idea what it's for. Maybe that's where the pump for the dead fountain lives. Much of the park is beautifully wooded, so it's a little surprise that under many trees you will see homeless people sleeping, or so after dark. We really haven't found them to be dangerous to us. Most of them don't even stop us to ask for money. I've even talked with some of Miami's homeless. While there are shelters and services nearby, Miami's pleasant weather makes it preferable for many of them to just sleep outside. And Bayfront Park has got to be one of the most pleasant places to call home when you have no home. We even stopped to talk with a police officer in the area. He confirmed that they generally leave the local homeless folks alone, so long as they generally behave themselves. He said they can always stop a police officer and ask for help. The police can call one of the city's green shirt outreach staffers to come offer whatever services they might need. But residents often help as well. I have seen several restaurants and outdoor vendors donate food directly to homeless locals, and have bought a few homeless folks meals as well. This rock garden was originally built in 1927, making it probably the oldest part of Bayfront Park. From what I can tell, it used to be very lush with tropical plants, a wooden bridge, and a water fountain near the entrance. It was expanded in the 1930s and 40s, but at this point it appears to be just a shadow of its former glory. At least they recently filled the pond back up with water.
There's a couple of food vendors along the waterfront walk here. They sell an interesting variety of common and uncommon things, including ceviche and kebabs, but they also sell a local Venezuelan favorite called arepas. And arepa is made from corn flour dough and is somewhere between a tortilla and a pancake in consistency. The ones they sell here are filled with queso fresco cheese and grilled up. They dish up a salty, greasy flavor rich with natural sweetness from the corn. The Bayfront Park Amphitheater is the big brother to the Tina Hills Pavilion. It has 2,600 fixed seats and overflow seating on the grass for a total capacity of 10,000 people. It's a shame you can't easily enter and walk around it from any particular side outside of events. However, since Bayside Marketplace often uses the rear service area and the hill over a service bunker as parking overflow, the gates are open for nosy pedestrians with cameras as well. Let's go take a look. I've always loved nosing around infrastructure, seeing how everything works from behind the scenes. And although I look forward to seeing a concert here someday soon, I also like seeing how they would manage it. The open air stage will accommodate many different setups and deal well with Miami's typical weather conditions, at least for the performers. But I also appreciate the cleverness of a loading dock right up against the backstage building that would largely be invisible to the audience. The various entrances to and right on the stage, the ramps for access to everything, the security well in front of the stage, the cordoned off VIP seating areas, the large bathroom areas on either side for the audience, the unobstructed views of the city skyline and the bay, the service bunker hidden under the artificial hill that separates the amphitheater from Bayside Marketplace's side driveway. It seems like the designers thought of everything. I've wondered for months now what the purpose was of these curved cutouts in the wall here. I thought maybe it was for ushers and security to stand out of the way. But then while I was filming, I finally noticed the pipes sticking out of each wall. One thin copper pipe above a larger PVC pipe below. Apparently there were water fountains here before. I wonder why they were removed. Technically, this spot was renamed to the FPL, Florida Power and Light, Solar Amphitheater at Bayfront Park. I think FPL wanted to show off its commitment to employing solar as part of its energy fleet. The awning here over the back end of the seating area looks cool and provides some shade for anyone back there, but I doubt that this solar array powers any of this facility directly. It more likely just feeds into the main grid when the sun is shining, and Bayfront just feeds off the grid full time. At least it looks cool and provides some shade. I think FPL also provided the funding for the 2009 upgrade to the amphitheater overall, including a lot of the infrastructure I was just describing. That mundane stuff may not be as sexy as an artistic solar array, but that mundane stuff makes a great event possible. Just on the other side of this artificial hilltop here is Bayside Marketplace. This $93 million addition from the mid 80s took up about half of Bayfront Park's real estate. We'll take a quick walk through part of it in a little bit. 
But Bayside is like a whole other world. One I've explored in the previous video to showcase some of its Friday night life. I hope to give some more background on it in a future video as well. But I think it's just worth pointing out how these two pieces very much fit together like hand and glove as part of a larger park. For example, on the other side of this bridge is the food court of Bayside, which is unusual in that it is located on the second floor of the structure instead of the first floor. I personally think this is a brilliant design choice for various reasons. It clears the ground level for shops and busy nightclubs, and it also means that 10,000 people can easily flow into the food court across this bridge. They were smart enough to put a bathroom facility on this side of the bridges too. No reason for people to have to deal with crossing the gap just to serve that need. What's more, these bathrooms are right over the service bunker I mentioned earlier. There are garage doors on either side of the, at the ground level. I'm sure there is essentially a warehouse down there. And small vehicles can probably drive right through from the service road to the backstage area. We're still on top of the service bunker here. Below me are garage doors into it, and that's the Christopher Columbus statue out in front of it. I think the staircase leading up here from the service drive is meant to be a grand exit to encourage people leaving a concert or other event to go straight to and through Bayside Marketplace. It turns out that the main parking ramps are on the other side of it, making it most convenient to pass by the shops and clubs on the ground floor on the way to your car. It's cool that a lot of the surface up here is paved with large pieces of coral. If you look closely, you'll see the details of these animal-made stones. Would you believe there's actually been Grand Prix auto racing out on Biscayne Boulevard and even right through this park in past years? And they were planning to do so again very soon. In late 2019 they scrapped the idea because downtown is no longer just a commercial area thanks to many high-rise condos and apartments like the one where we live. They decided to hold the next upcoming 2022 Grand Prix Miami at the Hard Rock Stadium Complex in Miami Gardens.
ahead is another one of Isamu Noguchi's contributions from the 80s. The laser light tower apparently used to feature lasers that shone out and reflected off nearby towers. I can't seem to find out much more than that, and I've had no luck finding any photos or videos of the light shows. Like the pepper fountain, it fell into disrepair a long time ago. Now the tower seems to only serve as a beacon guiding people to a public bathroom. The inscription here reads, The Tower of Light, a sculpture by Isamu Noguchi, donated by the Knight Foundation to the people of Miami for laser light shows, 1989. I do like the design of this space up here. People can stretch their legs during an intermission in a show at the amphitheater. They're separate from people on the ground level, with a nice overview of the park. It's a shame that the large opening to the covered walkway and open courtyard below has always been gated off on the ground level since we've arrived. I hope they start opening it up again sometime soon. I've seen the occasional car parked up here and assumed it was a staff service vehicle. But it's apparent today that this is just people parking wherever they feel like it. I'm honestly surprised that security hasn't come and ticketed them, or at least put barricades to stop them from possibly damaging some of the coral pavers, grass, and other surfaces. There's the amphitheater side of that service bunker. I'm betting you could drive a car right through to the service road between here and Bayside Marketplace. I'd be interested in seeing inside there and many other service facilities someday.
Here's that Christopher Columbus statue. In 1952, the Italian consul in Miami organized a committee to erect a statue in a different part of this park. The city contributed a location and the committee raised money to commission an Italian artist to create the bronze statue. Like many older things in the park, the statue has been quietly de-emphasized over the years as newer priorities emerge. As if to prove that it was not forgotten, vandals spray-painted it red during the BLM riots last July, along with a more prominent statue of Ponce de Leon out front. De Leon led the first official European expedition to Florida and served as the first governor of Puerto Rico in 1509. Both figures have become far more controversial ones in American history in recent decades. The police arrested the vandals and any rioters fighting them and probably saved both statues by doing so. Columbus statues and some other cities were decapitated or dismantled. So here we are at the entrance to Bayside Marketplace. Like I said, I don't want to spend too much time talking about it because it is a complex topic all its own, and an even more popular spot most of the time. The combination of an open-air mall, nightclubs, restaurants, a marina, a performance stage, a ferris wheel, and more make it a potent attraction for the city at all hours. For my wife and me, it is a fun place to walk and people watch. There's almost always something interesting to see. I love seeing the various banyan trees scattered around Bayfront and Bayside. They help add to the distinctive tropical flavor of the total park and provide much shade.
Off to the right there is the main pair of parking ramps for Bayside Marketplace, but we're walking out toward the streetside promenade along Biscayne Boulevard. Here's a statue of Simon Bolivar, the Liberator. Bolivar was a Venezuelan military and political leader who led the countries of Venezuela, Bolivia, Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, and Panama to independence from the Spanish Empire in the 19th century. This bust is of 19th century Chilean lawyer and naval officer Capitan Arturo Prat Chacon. He's a national hero to Chile. I don't know enough about his history to guess why he's honored with this statue in Miami though. The header of this plaque reads, A Cuban Salute to the Bicentennial. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I suspect that it was commissioned by Miami's Cuban community to celebrate the U.S. Bicentennial in 1975. This was a few years before the mass exodus of Cubans in 1980, but well after the 1953 revolution that swept Fidel Castro into power, beginning the flow of emigrants to America. And here's the Torch of Friendship wall. It was built in 1960 to be a sort of welcome sign for immigrants coming from Latin American and Caribbean countries. In 1964, it was rededicated to the memory of President John F. Kennedy after his assassination. And here's that Ponce de Leon statue we discussed earlier. It's been nicely cleaned up after it was vandalized last year with red spray paint. The promenade here has a distinctive geometric pattern laid out in differently colored bricks, carefully cut and exactly aligned. You could be forgiven for thinking that this is a paint job. There is a little damage here and there and some of the bricks have been replaced over the years. But overall it was very well built. It adds character to the boulevard. Many other sidewalks around town have similarly decorated designs as well. One thing Miami is famed for is its awful traffic. Be thankful I'm doing a walking tour today and not a driving tour.
it is. We happened entirely by chance to come across this Peruvian demonstration. I'm still learning Spanish, so I couldn't quite follow much, but I'll do my best to translate some of it. Many of the t-shirts read, A Forward Change. The Kneeling Boys poster reads, No to Communism, No to Terrorism. From Miami Peruvians, we support freedom and democracy. The Standing Boys poster reads, We did not experience terrorism, but our parents told us how cruel it was. I'm fairly sure the crowd started chanting queso presidente or cheese president. I'm not entirely sure what to make of that. Peru has a presidential election coming up next week. It's looking a bit like the polls are favoring Pedro Castillo, a socialist candidate, over Keiko Fujimori, daughter of the former president Alberto Fujimori. I suspect this demonstration was in support of Fujimori and in opposition to Castillo. I don't know much about Peruvian politics, but I'm delighted to see the community here exercising their freedom of speech and peaceful assembly to express their political opinions publicly. My rough plan had been to see the sights in the main park area, walk through Bayside Marketplace, and then finish up with a stroll along the promenade here. But I realized last minute that I had missed a bunch of things in the park. So back in we go! I'm delighted to see the flying trapeze school here. Most of the time when we walk through the park later at night, it's naturally empty. We got lucky this Sunday afternoon to see a little daredevil action. These are professionals who offer classes and even party events to introduce kids to trapeze arts. Just up ahead here is the slide mantra sculpture created once again by Isamu Noguchi. I like the overall look of it, but I rarely see children using this as a slide, nor do I see people getting up close to appreciate it as a sculpture. I think this piece illustrates one of the troubling things about Noguchi's artistic contributions to the park. The fountain, the laser tower, and the slide are all either non-functional 
are not particularly used much. If I may offer a gentle criticism, there's a pattern here of aesthetic vision trumping both practical maintenance considerations and whether Miami's residents and visitors will actually benefit from these things. By contrast, much of what we've encountered in Bayfront Park is very practical and still aesthetically pleasing. Could we not consider the Ferris wheel a dynamic sculpture, for example? Isn't the design of the FPL Solar Amphitheater aesthetically pleasing for a utility space? Do we grant sensory points for a cool breeze flowing through Bayside as one wanders its halls? Aren't the many trees and other landscaping a key part of what visitors can enjoy at both a distance and to wander aimlessly through? From what I've read, it seems that Noguchi came up with the overall vision of the park's current layout, which is quite different from what existed prior. The walkways are entirely different. The fountain was its centerpiece. He pushed hard for the removal of the giant marble library that existed front and center along the Biscayne Boulevard in order to visually connect the park to the city. So the park owes a lot to his vision. The non-functional parts don't entirely take away from the rest of what the park has to offer. During World War II, the park was taken over by the Navy. In 1943, the city built and dedicated this war memorial to honor Dade County's soldiers lost to the war. It may also incorporate names from other conflicts as well, but I get the impression it was only for that war. One end of the monument features a General MacArthur quote, We shall win or we shall die. The other contains a more inspiring FDR quote, it is far better to die on our feet than to live forever on our knees. Up ahead is a statue of Claude Pepper. He was the U.S. congressman to whom Bayfront was later rededicated as the Mildred and Claude Pepper Bayfront Park. Pepper was elected to the Senate in 1936 to represent Florida. After losing his seat, he was then elected to the House of Representatives in 1962. He served four different House districts in Florida until his death in 1989. Pepper was known for being a staunch left liberal who played a significant role in key New Deal initiatives. He was defeated in the Senate primary of 1950 by George Smathers in a campaign that accused Pepper of being a communist and having ties with the Soviet Union. Throughout that campaign, Pepper denied such allegations, and he went on later in life to become a staunch anti-communist and critic of Fidel Castro. We'll end our tour with a view of beautiful Biscayne Bay. That was most of the big things in Bayfront Park, and just a quick taste of Bayside Marketplace. I had no idea how much history I would find buried under Bayfront, and I've just given you a little taste of it. By the time I'm finished with this video, I'll have already put in the better part of 40 hours into research, filming, and producing it. If you enjoyed it, then I'd greatly appreciate a like. Consider subscribing too if you'd like to learn more about Miami with me. And check the description for links for a few other resources. Cheers!